today are continuing our week-long series, Bloomberg West Top 5, looking back at some of the top tech devices and events of the year, and looking ahead to the stories that you should be watching in 2012. Today, the top five game-changing products for next year, and joining us here in San Francisco with his predictions is Dylan Tweeney, the executive editor of VentureBeat. Thanks for being with us on Bloomberg West. Glad to be here. Let's get right to it. Number five on your list, Lytro. This is camera technology. Tell right. us about it. Okay, so this comes from a uh, technology that's been in the lab for a long time where instead of having light just falling on a sensor and recording pixels of light, they're actually recording the direction of all the light rays at one time. And then what this means is that you don't have to focus. You just take a picture, and then after the fact, it has all the data. You can focus on any part of the image you want. And this sounds like a, a, a great toy for people who are really drunk and want to get that yeah. picture that they've always <laughs> wanted. Exactly. It's got all kinds of other possibilities, too, because you could have, you could take a picture of this room, and then you could zoom in and, or decide you wanted to shift the highlight from one person to another person. Potentially very revolutionary. They announced it last year. They didn't actually ship. Um, I'm not sure that the Lytro camera itself is going to be a game changer, but yeah. this technology could totally make uh, a, a major difference in the way photography is done. The guy who came up with this made it the focus of his Stanford PhD and yes. then, boom, moved away with it. Um, I think it's at least 400 bucks. So I guess the yes. big question is whether people are comfortable enough with their iPhones taking pictures or right. do they want to take that next step? Right. It's 400 bucks and also the image quality is not that great yet. So it's, a, it's still evolving. All right. Top product number four for 2012, Kindle Fire 2. Tell us about why the Kindle Fire okay. dose makes yeah. the list. A dose, they should call it that. I, I'm not <laughs> sure, maybe the Kindle Bonfire okay. or something. <laughs> um, I, K Amazon got a lot of things right with the Kindle Fire, but they also got a lot of things wrong. There are some things that are just sort of obviously boneheaded about it. It doesn't have volume controls, the touch interface isn't that great, um, and it doesn't have good parental controls, for instance, so you're not comfortable giving it to your kids. All big problems. Despite that, it has sold very well. Amazon is really good at fixing problems in version 2. They did that with the Kindle as well, and I think they're going to do it with the Kindle Fire. Hearing what you're saying, I almost feel like there are people who are watching who would be frustrated that they bought the first version of the Kindle Fire. Well, a lot of people did. Four million, uh, well, four million bought Kindles. We don't know how many bought Kindle Fires, but there were a lot of Kindle Fires sold. I think probably it would have been better to wait. Um, when it comes to the business model, we know that they're not making money on selling the device. They're selling right. it at a small loss, right. but it's all about, just like with Apple, getting people to use that device to spend a lot of money, buying content, those yep. kinds of things. What have you been hearing? I mean, Amazon put out a release today about how their products have been selling. What about content that's being used through the Kindle Fire? I think it's too soon to tell, yeah. um, and probably it hasn't been that good, or they would be telling us something like, you know, a million TV shows were sold on the Kindle Fire last week. So I'm guessing it's not that great to start with. But Amazon is one of the few companies, other than Apple, that's actually in a position to do the whole ecosystem, apps, music, video, and, you know, heck, you could use a Kindle Fire to shop for gardening supplies or books or, or uh, clothing as well. So it's basically like a little shopping cart in your living room. They've got to love that. If that is the case, have Apple and Amazon locked up this tablet market, or are we still going to be talking about some other devices next year too, do you think? There are a ton of Android devices out there, and uh, with Windows 8 coming, there may be Windows tablets yeah. uh, in the second part of the year as well. A lot of these devices are impressive technically, um, but I just don't think really have a chance yet until other companies figure out that whole ecosystem. Okay, that's the tablet talk. Let's get to top product number three, which is more than just a gadget. It's going to cost you some money. It is a car. It is a new Tesla, the Model S. Tell us about that. Okay, so the Tesla Model S is Tesla's first kind of mainstream sedan. Uh, they, they actually have a very intelligent approach to the market where they decided we're not going to make these goofy, like, three-wheeled, uh, golf, super, super-sized golf carts that a lot of other electric car makers are doing. They went right for the high end with this Roadster, which was sexy, fast, powerful. Everybody wanted it. If they had a ton of money, they maybe got one. They're kind of starting to move down the market now with a sedan that will have uh, great, much greater range than any other electric car in the market and will be a practical family car. So they changed the game by bringing down the price a little bit. Is that what it is? And, and, and grabbing more of the market? Or? Right. Well, so the Roadster is a two-seater sports car, and it's you know $100,000 or something. It's meant for rich people to show off. The, the Model S is potentially a family car, 
but it has a range of 300 miles, which is two to three times what the Leaf has or, or the Chevy or, or, the, or the Volt. Um, and uh, it goes from zero to 60 in under six seconds, which is not bad. So they're basically taking technology, testing it out on the high end of the market, and using that to fund the next step down, which is the middle of the market. What are the other players thinking about? You mentioned Leaf. Actually, Joe Brown of Gizmodo was on earlier this uh, week, and he talked about that being one of the big products of 2011. So the other Absolutely. guys have to be watching what Tesla is doing and saying, hold on a second, we're going to try and keep you honest. Absolutely. Um, Joe's right. The Leaf is a great car. It's uh, probably the most successful electric car that's on the market yet. Um, but it's still got a range of, you know, 80 to 120 miles, depending on how you drive it, which means, you know, you, you can't take it to Sacramento. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> Not that anybody would want to go to Sacramento. Oh, hold on. <laughs> we got viewers in Sacramento. Well, let's get to your number two product, Nokia's new smartphones, the Lumia 800 and the 710. Tell right. us about them. Okay, so this year, Nokia and Microsoft got together, and uh, I think this is one of the most significant partnerships to happen in the mobile uh, world in a long time because uh, Microsoft has this great new reinvented uh, Windows Phone operating system, and Nokia has been struggling for years with its uh, yeah, Symbian. Two, two right? companies that you don't think of changing the game that much over right. the last few years. Right. Yeah. But, so both of them were facing, you know, basically losing the whole game. Put them together, Nokia makes great hardware, always has made great hardware. Microsoft now has a decent operating system for that hardware. We're start, the Lumia 800 and 710 are the first two products that are kind of uh, the fruits of that combination. They'll come to the U.S. in the coming year. They're, they look pretty darn good. Uh, it, who are these phones designed for? Uh, the CEO of Nokia has talked about wanting to have business customers, right. but, but it very much looks like something that they're trying to go after the consumer they're market. They're consumer phones, yeah. yeah, and I think that's what Nokia's strength probably is. Yeah. The 800 is meant to be a competitive high-end smartphone, and the 710 is a you know, phone that you pick up for $100 with a contract. And, um, you know, I think there's potential in both of those markets. What's really going to make or break these two companies' partnership uh, is whether they can get carriers to go along with this. And, and what is that selling feature? I mean, is it, is it the software? Uh, going back to what Joe Brown of Gizmodo was telling us earlier in the week, one of the, the, the great products of 2011 for him was this Mango operating system right. from, from Windows. Right. So I think it's the operating system uh, and the fact that it's not iPhone, uh, and it's not Android, and it, and it actually works and is elegant and is well thought out. And this is, the, this is a big problem with Android. They have been very successful in selling a lot of Android phones from a lot of different makers, but I think in the coming year, the, the inconsistencies between the implementation of Android, people's frustration with being able to upgrade to different versions, so just sort of the general kludginess of the yeah. OS are going to start bothering people. Very quickly before we get to our number one, what if, what if it doesn't sell well? Then what next for, say, Nokia? It's, it's, that's tough to say. I mean, they, they still sell an enormous number of cheap phones, but I think it's over for smartphones. For okay, them. and your top product for 2012, Apple's expected TV. Yes. Okay, now people have been predicting a TV year after year. So <laughs> I, I, forgive, uh, I, for, I forgive you if you want to roll your eyes at me okay. over this. But, <laughs> but I think it's going to happen this year. A lot of signs are pointing to this. We've got, you know, comp from component suppliers in Asia to analysts to track Apple. Comments from Steve Jobs to his right. biography. Right, exactly. Yeah. And his biography is like, I've cracked it, yeah, right? So yeah, I yeah. think it's going to happen this year. But there have been products like this on the market already. Right. Right. So how does Apple hit the home run? So Apple TV is out, right, the, the, and it's not a great seller. I think the way that they make this really succeed is they make it more than half-baked. Apple TV is basically a way to deliver digital content that you've already got, but it's not well integrated into the TV, so you have to flip back and forth between the Apple TV and your television. If they integrate it into a television set and make it easy for you to switch from, say, watching cable TV to looking up something on the Internet, might work. That seems so key. Having some kind of relationship with the cable companies or the content companies right. seems so important here because right. the way people use TV, Apple TV as it exists now, you know, you download an episode here, an episode there, right. but regular TV watchers want to watch everything all the time as soon as it's available. Yes. Uh, the other thing is I think they're not going after the living room, they're not going after the home theater, yeah. uh, where people just want to kind of sit back and watch the game or whatever. I think that what they're going to go after is the second TV in the home, a smaller screen probably, you know, 24 or 30 inch screen, something that you might have in your bedroom that you might also play games on or interact with apps on or want to check the weather on, something that would actually play to the strengths of Apple's iOS platform. 
All right, Dylan, thanks for being here. We'll Pleasure. have to have you back next year to find out if those five panned out, yeah. those predictions for 2012. Dylan Tweeney, the executive editor of VentureBeat.